Hello, everyone. I'm Maddie Simiatiki. I'm the interim director of the School of Cities. Um, we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. Even though we're hosting this event virtually today, uh, all of the uh, speakers are based here in Toronto, and we are extremely grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Today, we're having a very special conversation uh, with uh, Ken Greenberg um, and Melinda Yogendran. And Ken is one of the leading urban thinkers, um, practitioners, uh, and most recently, Order of Canada recipient and a recipient of an honorary degree uh, from the University of Toronto, recognizing his uh, distinguished practice uh, in uh, urbanism. Melinda Yogendran is a, a is a graduating student from our Masters of Planning program at the University of Toronto uh, with uh, interests in um, in food justice and food policy and community and specialization in community development. And given uh, that, that Ken has just recently been awarded an honorary degree from the University of Toronto, uh, he was gearing up to give uh, an in-person convocation address uh, to uh, the assembled students to share his wisdom uh, and experience uh, with, uh, with our, our, student, our graduating students. Uh, this year, of course, uh, convocations in person have been cancelled, uh, and Ken wrote a, a really passionate uh, address about the future of cities and how, uh, in this moment of uncertainty with COVID-19, uh, cities uh, uh, are going to play an increasing role in our uh, recovery, and getting cities right is critical uh, to the future of uh, societies and to our communities. We thought today it would be a wonderful opportunity for Ken uh, to speak about his uh, address, uh, the convocation address he was going to give, which he published uh, in, in the Toronto Star, uh, and then also to have what we're thinking of as an intergenerational conversation, a chance for uh, Ken, Melinda, and myself to have a conversation about some of the key themes that, that, that come out of Ken's address and to, uh, to think through um, Ken's uh, experiences as he's uh, uh, gone through many planning projects and many uh, urban uh, challenges and to reflect them and to, get, to, to reflect them through the prism of what our current graduates are going to be experiencing as they go out into the uh, working world. So what we'll do today is I'll first turn it over to Ken uh, to speak for five to seven minutes about uh, his, uh, his address to lay out his key points. And then I'll facilitate a, a discussion with Ken and Melinda and I'll maybe throw in some questions as well. Uh, for the audience, you can also use the Q&A uh, in, the, in the bottom bar of, uh, of Zoom and you can submit questions. Uh, if there's an opportunity, I'll try to weave as many of them in, recognizing that we only have uh, a, a little over 50 minutes and I'll try my best uh, to get uh, questions in. So uh, to kick us off, Ken, I'll uh, turn the floor over to you and uh, uh, to make some introductory remarks about your convocation address. Well, thank you very much, Maddie, and thank you uh, U of T School of Cities for this invitation. Um, like everybody else, uh, I feel a regret about so many things we're missing, including the opportunity to speak to graduating students on the campus. Uh, but I welcome this uh, opportunity to have this chat with Melinda. So hi, Melinda, and looking forward to, uh, to talking with you. Um, I thought I would start off by just kind of the highlights of what um, I might have um, covered in the um, talk uh, at, at convocation. And it first sent me back to remembering my time at U of T. And when, when I first arrived at 230 College Street, which was then the School of Architecture, and I was um, in fourth year in architecture. I, I ended up uh, spending two years at the school. And it was, I was a new immigrant just arriving in the country. And this was really a momentous experience. And it shaped 
um, my career to a large extent. The city I discovered was in the early stages of a, an extraordinary paradigm shift, uh, moving away from a model of the North American city that had been pervasively adopted, one that was based on building highways, um, urban renewal in the hearts of cities, separating where people lived from where they worked. And Toronto had, was deciding to set itself a different direction. And it was pretty heady stuff and pretty interesting stuff. And among other things, I was lucky enough to uh, meet Jane Jacobs, whose great book, Death and Life in Great American Cities, I had just read, published in 1961. Uh, and she and I, and I arrived in Toronto within months of each other. And I called her and asked her to give me a crit on one of my projects in the School of Architecture. And she was generous enough to do that. And that became uh, the beginning of a lifelong friendship. Um, from there, uh, I got involved with the Reform Council. I ended up working for the City of Toronto, setting up a division of architecture and urban design, working for three mayors for 10 years, starting with David Crombie. Um, I wrote a couple of books talking about that, Walking Home in 2011 and Toronto Reborn in 2019. So pivoting from that, which was my equivalent, that early initiation in Toronto, which was my equivalent of what Melinda and her fellow graduating students are going through I wanted to reflect a little bit on what COVID-19 means. And one way of thinking about it is um, it has moved us into the passing lane on the agenda that the city had already set itself and was pursuing. Uh, Mary Rowe has been referring to this as a particle accelerator. It's pushing everything faster and it's raising some really important issues and two amongst them of great significance are resilience and equity. And that um, combination, they are very much tied together, speak to the possibility of a different kind of city um, that we may, and it's really up to us, we may end up creating uh, for ourselves, and I think it's, it's that opportunity, that possibility that I wanted to speak to the students about. We are in effect in a kind of dress rehearsal with COVID-19 for an entirely different way of seeing the city, of seeing the world, uh, preparing ourselves for what is arguably an even greater existential crisis, which is that of climate change. And so um, how we work together, how we come together, government, private sector, philanthropic sector, nonprofits will say a great deal about how that happens. Um, Jane Jacobs used the term uh, a force measure, something that comes along which is of such magnitude that it has the power to change everything, to cause people to think differently, to act differently, and I, I would describe this moment of COVID-19 as such a force measure. And I mean, the final thing I wanted to say to the students is the moment that I arrived in Toronto and was a, a young graduate going out into the field, I didn't so much choose my career as it chose me. This tsunami that I found myself involved in shaped everything I did, shaped the way I thought about the world, shaped the people I connected with and shape my experience. And I think the same is true for Melinda and her classmates, that in effect, COVID-19 has chosen them. It's given them uh, an obligation, a responsibility, a kind of mission, uh, something which is impossible to ignore as they go out into the world of practice or teaching or whatever uh, career path uh, they choose. And I sometimes think in our professions, in design, in planning, in related areas, all tied to city building, there should be something like a Hippocratic Oath, which is that we are not just working for the people who pay us, 
for whatever particular assignment we're given or study or building to build or neighborhood to develop. But we have a larger responsibility to the body politic, to our fellow citizens, to the future of our city, to our children, to our grandchildren. I think the fact that indigenous people talk so frequently about seven generations when you think of what you're gonna do has, has a special resonance for me, perhaps more so now than before. I can actually imagine at this stage in my life what that span of seven generations looks like. I, I can reach back to my grandparents and their parents and I think of my grandchildren and I'm there. Uh, it, it has gone from being a saying to being something that has a, a tangible mm -hmm. reality. So what's interesting, and you mentioned the term intergenerational, is this idea of passing the baton. And so here we are, we are three generations mm -hmm. on this call. We all, have, we're learning from each other. And I think it, it's an intergenerational exchange. Uh, hopefully we're collaborating across those generations um, to try and leave the world a better place um, than what we started with. Thank you, Ken. Uh, Melinda, I wanna uh, turn to you now uh, to, to give you a chance to give some uh, uh, introductory thoughts on some of the ideas that came out of Ken's uh, uh, remarks and then also perhaps uh, uh, ask a question or, or make or, or you, you can start to lead the discussion uh, uh, now and, and, and give some of your initial uh, 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 thoughts on the key themes that have come up. Sure and thank you Ken I, I really appreciate a lot of what you said there and I think there's so many directions that we could go. Um, I, I'm very interested in what you were saying about opportunities for Toronto and I think there are some examples that we can already see that are sort of surprising and one example I'm thinking of is how quickly the city approved the construction of new supportive housing units and the other example that comes to mind is that the federal government has been talking about sick leave protection for workers in Canada which is something that people have been fighting for for a long long time um, and those are really just beginning to scratch the surface of what needs to be happening but there's definitely a new urgency and attention to those issues that is accelerating these changes. Um, but I want to start by focusing on what you were saying about the larger responsibility and the idea of really understanding who it is that we're working for. Because to me, building a better and more equitable city involves democratizing city building and planning processes um, and creating a space for more of a voice for the public. So I wonder if you can tell us a bit about how maybe over your career you've seen the role of the public change and then also going forward, how we can continue to create a better process of engagement and listening that values and prioritizes residents. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things in, in what you've just said, Melinda, but I, I wanna start with the fact that um, one of the things that COVID-19 has revealed to us dramatically is the, the, the inequities in our city. The fact that we, the city, um, the most vulnerable in our city clearly are experiencing this pandemic differently. We're learning more and more about that. I think the most obvious and immediate example was what happened to seniors in long-term care. We also just learned today about where um, the greatest number of cases are happening in the city, which no surprise are in the north Northeast and Northwest, where we have the largest concentrations of poverty. We have uh, new arrivals, immigrant populations. And so um, one of the things that I feel is a particular responsibility that Torontonians have, or an obligation that we've taken on, is we are arguably the most diverse city on the planet right now. And we pride ourselves on that. We believe that that is central to our identity and it has a lot to do with our extraordinary growth, but it is not to be taken for granted at all. And I think what, you know, the, we may have gotten a little bit um, overconfident and perhaps even smug about how well we're doing that. It's, it's clear that we do it better than many other places we benefited from that diversity, we continue to do so socially, economically, uh, intellectually, and in, in every way. 
but now comes this need to actually do the things that will make that work. So the examples you've given of turning to doing affordable housing, recognizing that the private marketplace does not provide housing for the entire spectrum of our population. What it does is it distributes us by postal code in very inequitable ways. Um, that we have people working in impossible conditions and hence sick leave, which is the other thing that you mentioned. Um, people who don't have benefits, who have to take a series of part-time jobs in order to make a living. And that's been shown to make them extremely vulnerable and make the rest of us vulnerable at the same time. So lastly, the question is, how do we learn about such things? How do we know about such things? Who do we listen to when we make plans for cities? And I'll go back to um, that moment, that earlier moment when I was coming up, uh, when a lot of the um, technical experts, the people who were acknowledged leaders in the field, had a very top-down view of what the city should be. And they were very convinced about that. And along comes Jane Jacobs as a young journalist who's walking the pavements in New York City. And she's seeing that all the things that she had been writing about for an architectural magazine um, weren't turning out the way the designers thought they were. And in fact, her keen powers of observation and her questioning mind led her to challenge the entire way the professions were thinking about things. And one of the keystones was engaging people, listening to people, developing ways of collaboratively doing design. I, I think she said something like, if a city is not made by everybody, it doesn't work for anybody. And so um, that has been a cornerstone of my practice all the way along. Uh, I've found that um, it works amazingly well. And even when you have views that seem to be diametrically opposed if you can listen to people carefully and if you can draw them out and see what their needs are, what their apprehensions are, what their goals and aspirations are, and get them into a conversation, not just with me as a professional, but with each other, that's where the richest outcomes actually occur. Melinda, maybe I can uh, then ask a question that occurs to me uh, from Ken's uh, comments which is how did, how did your class learn about the role of uh, planners and designers and, and, and uh, professionals? Uh, there's been a, a significant evolution in how we think about the role of, uh, of the planner from uh, being an expert uh, to in many cases, there was a lot of writing on advocacy planning uh, and even activist planning, uh, the planner as an activist. And I'm wondering how you and your cohort uh, see uh, your role as you enter into the uh, professional world. Yeah. Well, okay. Go ahead, I Melinda. I mean, I Go think ahead, Melinda. it does feel as though the definition of what it means to be a planner has widened beyond conventional planning, and there seems to be a much wider range of things that planners are doing. And so, I guess for us, I would like to see, similar to what Ken was saying, support for more community-driven projects and community-driven policy. And I think the people who have the deepest and most intricate understanding of what needs to happen are the people who experience the impacts of these projects and policies on a day-to-day -day basis. And so they're in many ways the best equipped to guide and inform change. So yeah, I mean, giving more decision-making power to the public, which I think looks like lessening restrictions on public participation by including people at every stage of the process and co-developing alongside communities, um, and also providing spaces for people outside of institutions and formalized positions to have more instructive roles. Yeah. You know, oh, go ahead, Ken. I was going to say that that's a really um, interesting set of questions. And I, I think when I was just entering the field, I actually started off in a small architectural practice. I got recruited by David Crombie to come in and set up this, what became the Division of Architecture and Urban Design. And it led me off into a different career and that became my graduate school. But the presumption that I and my colleagues, my fellow graduates started with was the professionals. And, and we had this slogan, never trust anybody over 30. So it just shows you where we were coming from. Um, 
I, I don't know if you would even be trusted, Melinda. You're probably pretty close. <laughs> um, we assumed that the people who were in charge didn't know what they were doing. And so our bias was to challenge. We were interested in what we called counter plans. These were the plans that challenged the um, officially sanctioned plans. Um, and, and it got to the point where there was such a distrust of the professionals and the professions that it went all the way the other way, that anything that they might be coming up with was somehow fatally flawed. And it led to, um, in the case of Toronto planning, a really interesting thing happened at the city, which was decentralization of city planning. Uh, there were site planning offices set up around the city. The planners were sent out of city hall and they were in storefronts in neighborhoods throughout the city. Community engagement was the key. Uh, a lot of public meetings, a lot of discussions. Um, people were hired as planners who didn't have planning degrees, whose real expertise actually was in community involvement. I think we've come now to a point where it's possible to acknowledge that yes, there are things that skilled professionals can contribute, very important things to that conversation, that there is uh, real expertise, that in some cases um, having data, having information is very valuable. It's not just about feelings, but finding a way to balance things is really important. So one of the things I'm very, uh, I believe a great deal in is uh, something called the wisdom of crowds. James Sirwicky, who wrote a column on economics for the New Yorker for many years, talked about the fact that if you have the right table under the right circumstances, the people around the table are smarter than any individual at the table. And so how to facilitate that conversation, facilitate that discussion and draw people out but at the same time, the planner, not just as a recording secretary and trying to just capture what everybody else says, the planner, the urban designer, the uh, architect, the landscape architect, the engineer, the ecologist, the economist, all the artists, all making valuable contributions and adding ingredients that people might not come up with otherwise. One thing I worry about is the idea of doing planning by polling. And what I mean by that is, you know, in extreme circumstances, people have tried the idea that you turn the whole planning exercise into a whole series of multiple choice questions. Or, you know, you're sitting there with a computer terminal and you're answering all these questions and you tally up all the results and that gives you the answer. Because what that misses is the value of conversation the value of people actually listening to each other, hearing each other's arguments, um, being involved in debate and dialogue. And out of that comes something that no one would have come up with individually. So I think part of our role now is to be synthesizers, to be multilingual in the, spec in the sense that we speak the languages of many of the different participants. We understand where their allied professions are coming from and we have the ability to pull the strands together and to engage in that conversation where we become great listeners but also active participants in the conversation. So this idea of how communities engage in decision making and even uh, uh, allocating or diffusing decision making from experts to uh, communities has been an idea that's been in planning for 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 decades and it's so seductive and yet in practice uh, achieving that level of legitimacy uh, has been very difficult and Melinda I'm wondering if, if you can speak from your planning education and some of your your practice what strategies uh, you think will work for um, new graduates who are coming out into the planning world to, to engage with communities in a way that's meaningful the word legitimacy keeps coming to my mind. We often do a lot of consultation and in many communities, uh, when you speak to people, they say, well, I, was spo I, I spoke to someone, but it didn't feel like I was heard. There's a crisis, in many ways, there's a crisis of legitimacy around consultation, not a crisis of quantity of consultation. 
And I'm wondering, uh, these, these seem to be debates and discussions uh, building on some of the ideas that Ken has articulated. They seem to be discussions that happen a lot in planning schools. And I'm wondering, as you go out into the workforce, how you've come to conceptualize how you'll work with uh, communities and, and, and think about that, that, that role for you as, as, a, as, a, as a planner. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the idea of community-driven planning and community-driven policy works best when planners can sort of tap into what is already going on in communities and work with the strengths and the assets that are already in these neighborhoods. I think that if, if people are given the tools and the resources and support for a lot of what is already going on, we would be surprised at how quickly the city could begin to thrive in a more equitable way. Um, can, can I just build on that? I, I think one of the greatest mistakes that the um, planners and designers that Jane Jacobs was criticizing when she wrote Death and Life was to assume a tabula rasa, was to assume that they would go into a part of a city and there was nothing of value there. And they could basically start from scratch and redesign the world. And to your point about starting with what exists, the people who are there, the lives they're living, the institutions, which may be very modest, the businesses that are in place, the dynamics of life as it's being lived is so important and sensitizing ourselves to that. And not only that, the flow of history, not seeing it as a snapshot of a present moment, but actually trying to understand what led to the moment that you see when you go to a certain place. How, how was it formed? What were the uh, sort of forces that shaped it? How are people feeling about that? And developing a fourth dimensional understanding in time. And then an acknowledgement that the role we get to play in a city is we get to have our hands on the steering wheel, so to speak, for a very short moment in time so much preceded us and so much will follow us and to have a kind of humility about that so the changes we make are actually changes at the margin as opposed to radical open heart surgery that's going to take away everything and start all over again and i think if if we can have that mindset we can often see value great value in things that have been overlooked and weave those into the plans that we make. Let me pick up on a question I'm seeing in the Q&A from uh, uh, Leonard Musigwa, who's joining us all the way from Uganda. Uh, Leonard is gonna be a future PhD student uh, in the Department of Planning at U of T, uh, starting in the fall. And his question is, is, is at its core about issues of power and inequality, that when we talk about consultation, there are uh, people who have different access, uh, to information and different access to the corridors of power and how do we uh, engage with uh, the diversity of, of, of people in our cities and ensure that those who uh, may have the least amount of power or the least amount of access or be the most time crunched uh, and, mo and also might be the most impacted and affected by uh, urban development as it goes forward. How do we ensure that their uh, voices are heard and that their interests are served in uh, the plans that are being made? So I'm, I'm gonna give you a specific example to answer that question, because it's something I've dealt with over and over, but here's a, here's a really interesting one. I got involved in creating the master plan for Brooklyn Bridge Park. For those of you who don't know, um, it, it's an area along the East River, it's right at the base of the Brooklyn Bridge heading out to New York Harbor. Um, it was a series of piers that became obsolescent and then the idea emerged that this would become a great public park. It just so happens that sitting above those piers is Brooklyn Heights, where some of the, mo the wealthiest and most powerful people in New York live in a beautiful neighborhood with a promenade overlooking the East River. But right in the immediate vicinity, there are public housing projects, and there are older neighborhoods um, where young people were moving into Brooklyn and you had downtown Brooklyn, which was the heart of a neighborhood that served an extremely diverse population. And not surprisingly, 
the issues of whose park was this going to be? Whose turf would it be? Emerged almost immediately where all these different all groups, these different, these different, these different group were putting themselves. Uh oh, we have an echo. We have here. an echo here. I can hear you okay. All right, I'll continue. Right, I'll continue. Yeah. Um, um, I hope everybody's <laughs> not hearing me twice. This this will be challenging. No, only uh, once. Okay. <laughs> so we devised a strategy to diffuse the tensions. And of necessity, it was really the only way to move ahead. We created a series of workshops in the community. Um, and we did an exercise called SWAT, Strengths, Weaknesses, Opportunities, and Threats, which always works. But what we did is we invited the people who lived in Brooklyn Heights to actually come to meetings in the community centers in the public housing projects where they never would have stepped foot. Conversely, we invited the people from the public housing projects to come into the Heights into meeting places that were completely unfamiliar to them. And we, we had this kind of movable feast of all, and deliberately getting people to sit at tables where we mixed the tables up so that people were not only listening to those of us who were making presentations and running the meetings, they were actually chatting with each other. And we drew them out around first the strengths that they all saw in the neighborhood and i have never found a situation where if you start with the strengths not with the apprehensions and not with the fears the threats the weaknesses you will always find some things that people agree on which is usually pride of place there are things about the neighborhoods they love and they pride themselves on anyway long story short brooklyn bridge park and for those of you who have visited it i'm absolutely confident you will agree has something for everybody. And it is an extremely welcoming park for all Brooklynites, all New Yorkers. Um, it welcomes teenage kids from a neighborhood who are shooting hoops. It has uh, beautiful gardens. It has uh, places to experience uh, play for young families with uh, young children everything in between and because of the nature of a great public park it is possible to do that without anybody claiming exclusivity over the turf but in order to get us to the point where we were able to get the mayor of new york and the governor of the state of new york to be confident about committing funds they had to know that that community all of the members of that community were behind the project so that initial stage of getting people to know each other a bit, to hear each other and to hear ideas. And with my colleague, Michael Van Valkenburg, who became the landscape park, the architect of the park, ideas that were actually inclusive ideas about what a park could be. It wasn't uh, a kind of limited pie that somebody was gonna claim, but you could actually grow the pie and make it serve everyone. Melinda, I'm, I'm, uh, I'd like to turn to you and get your thoughts on how, uh, how you see uh, power and inequalities playing out in planning decisions and uh, how, uh, uh, in your experiences, uh, those uh, inequalities uh, uh, can be overcome uh, by planners. Yeah, I mean, I think when we think about a very typical form of engagement for planners and the way that things are often still done, we do see that the people who are facing the brunt of most inequalities are often not sitting at the table. So I think sort of what Ken was saying before about making sure that you have enough voice at the table that you're actually representing who is in your city, I think that's a big part of it. Um, and I, the, the power dynamic between the planners and the city and the public, I think part of that is really just acknowledging that it exists and being really honest with people about what you can do with their voice. Because I think a lot of times planners will sit in an engagement room and sit in a consultation and then walk away and sort of choose whether or not they really want to listen. Um, and I think there is a lot to be said for just being honest about 
what it is you're doing and what it is you can do with people's voices. Yeah, I, I think also, and you know, this is one of the remarkable things about our city and our city region is having people in the profession who actually have firsthand life experience of the communities we're serving. In other words, using the language that people often use, how do you see so quote unquote people like us, whoever us happens to be in the positions of being planners. It's not one group of people planning for another group of people, but it's us planning for ourselves. And I, I just want, I have to cite uh, what is really a, an extraordinary experience I'm having where I've been embedded for the last year in the city of Brampton as a strategic advisor and I'm working with a, a team of young professionals who look just like who lives in Brampton. The, the, the faces of the people on the team um, represent the extraordinary diversity of a community where well over 50% are from another country and well, well over 50% identifies visible minorities. And the, what comes with that is so interesting. Some of them were born in Canada. Some of them came as immigrants themselves as I did as a, as a young person. But the enlarged gene pool of ideas is so valuable. You don't have people coming from only one point of view. And I was in a meeting this morning, I have to say, uh, an online meeting about Brampton. And we were talking about um, a transforming neighborhood where a shopping mall is being turned into a new neighborhood for 20,000 people. And one of the people who was on the uh, webinar worked for the parks department. And at one point she said, oh, well, I live in that neighborhood. And I know exactly what goes on. I grew up there. And having that connection, being able to relate professionally to what you know about how life is lived. And not everybody will have that. So we have to tap the sources where people can let us know, not just through statistics or abstractions, but what, what is actually the nature of walking in those shoes of experiencing that daily life and making that part of the, of the enriched discussion. Can I ask, pick up on one of the themes that you, uh, you spoke about, which is uh, the balance between incremental change and uh, significant or even in some cases radical transformation. Uh, the work you're doing in Brampton uh, in many ways is uh, about subtly integrating new developments into an existing urban fabric. And in other ways, it's very much about reshaping uh, uh, suburbs that is in, in, in its initial sense focused on Brampton, but in many ways has uh, much larger implications and perhaps lessons learned uh, if it can be done well uh, for issues of resilience, for issues of uh, equality, for issues of uh, finances and economy. I'm wondering if you can talk about how in your practice you balance that notion of people wanting both very dramatic changes, but also in some cases, a, an inertia uh, for incrementalism. It's a really, really tough and interesting question, man. Um, so I'll go back to the big paradigm shift that I was involved in as a young professional, where Toronto decided to be a different kind of city from the cities we were observing looking across the border in the US and all the radical things they were doing to themselves. And we chose a radical path, but what was radical was not doing things. So not building expressways, not tearing up streetcars, not demolishing neighborhoods, um, helping main streets to survive, uh, doing mixed income housing, because historically the city had been much more in mixed income before we hit the wave after World War II where we were segregating uh, people into very different kinds of income, uh, neighbor, income based neighborhoods. So part of it, it was very radical, but at the same time, it was drawing on a deep well of things that people cared about. And one of the things we used to say at the time was it was this strange combination of new left politics and small C conservatism. And so if I fast forward to the present moment, in communities like Brampton in the, in the city region, there's some big things that are changing. We're trying to give people alternatives to relying on the car for 
every trip that they have to make to make uh, development more transit oriented, to invest in the GO system with all day GO service at 15 minute headways, to bring in light rail, to um, move away from continuing to sprawl out into greenfields. That's, that's a, a significant departure and that's what Brampton with its 2040 vision and in some, to some extent all the other 905 municipalities are committing themselves to doing. At the same time, there is the other aspect of finding local resources, local institutions, local things that are already happening that we can tap into. And, and that's where the, the continuity um, comes into play. So one of, one of the things that's fascinating in the 905 right now, um, for people who listen to Suresh Das, who talks about food on Metro Morning, he, can, he keeps pointing out that some of the greatest food is to be found in the strip malls around the city because that, that's where cheaper rents are available and that's where the people who are coming from every place who have culinary skills um, are living. And so finding a way to create places in new development, which we're talking about very much, where you don't just get all the national or international franchise outlets, but you actually deliberately create live workspaces and spaces for small enterprises, things that arise out of the community. And you know, to continue with my conversation of, or my point about Suresh Das, he points out all in Brampton in particular, but not exclusively, there are all kinds of illegal businesses that people are running out of their apartments preparing food. These kind of black market restaurants, if I can call them that. How, how do you give them an opportunity in these new places that are being created to actually do what they do in public places and by virtue of doing that, make them uh, more interesting and more viable. So it, it, it's a very interesting line between radical change and continuity. Melinda, uh, I'd like to ask you a similar question about how you see um, uh, the pace of change. Are you, uh, as you uh, go out into the uh, workforce at the beginning of your career, are you uh, impatient and seeking radical uh, change and transformation? Uh, are you someone that, that, that thinks incrementalism uh, is, is, is the best path forward? How are you uh, uh, grappling with, 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 with those sometimes dueling uh, impulses and pressures? Yeah, I will say that that is something I've thought a lot about over the last two years. The, the difference between incremental change and radical change or even trying to make change from within versus completely outside the system. Um, and I don't really have an answer still to this day. I think it's, it's a long road to figure it out. Um, but I, I think I sort of had this feeling of, you know, incremental change feels like the easiest avenue. But I do think because of the moment that we are in, there is space for more radical change. And there is space for things to happen quicker and with more support than ever before. And I think like I'm saying, that's because all of these inequalities and these vulnerabilities have such a brighter light shining on them. Um, so yeah, I think because of this moment, I do have hope for more radical change. I, I, I think one thing uh, I wanna mention here is the role of what I'll call pilots or tests. And I think we're allowing ourselves in this moment of COVID, just because we have to, uh, we're seeing the pressure on public spaces. I have never seen, um, my wife and I go out for bike rides almost every day. We've never seen so many people walking, cycling, jogging, trying to find a place to sit on a, in a green space, to be with other people, which we really want to do. We really want that sense of being with others. And the public realm that we've inherited doesn't work. So cities around the world, and Toronto is kind of joining the party now, are improvising on the fly and turning over, in some cases, hundreds of kilometers of traffic lanes to active transportation. In our case, uh, a little more gradually, but still for Toronto, uh, the announcement of 57 kilometers the other day and more to come, it's a, it's a pretty big departure. 
But instead of studying things to death, which we don't have the luxury of doing now, or insisting on finding the perfect universal solutions before we make a move, we're in the mood now to try things, to try new ways. And I think cities have always been places of invention, of discovery, of trial and error. And we mustn't be terrified by the idea that, we, that some things might not work out perfectly. There might be some mistakes, some things we will learn from how they work. Uh, the King Street pilot in Toronto was a great example of such a pilot. Uh, the transformation of Queen's Key actually started with a pilot. And so I, I think that's, that's one of the things that we can take advantage of now. The fact that we pivoted almost instantly to get homeless people into hotel rooms and pointed a way to doing things faster, that we're gonna do modular housing, which we had been talking about endlessly, and now suddenly it seems possible to do that. I, I think that sense of allowing the city to do what it does best, which is invention, and bringing that into our modus operandi is, um, is really, really important. And so that's a form of incrementalism because it shows, and in many cases, we're trying different things simultaneously and seeing what works and then um, sort of calling the successes out and expanding on them. As we move into the last um, few minutes, I wanna pick up on some of the themes that are coming across in the questions, which are really about where to from here um, the pandemic has clearly impacted cities in, uh, in, in, in deep uh, and, and lasting ways. And uh, I, I, I wonder, um, Melinda, if you can start by, 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 think, by thinking and, and telling us, what, were, what are the types of changes that you would like to see uh, that you think would be uh, the best uh, and most significant changes that we could make to our cities uh, uh, to coming out of the pandemic to make them more resilient, more equitable, uh, more just, more prosperous. What are the changes you'd really like, uh, like to see right now? What I would like to see is ideally a critical reflection on the people in the parts of our city that have been constantly neglected and reprioritizing the people and communities in our city that are the most vulnerable. And that looks like centering the voices of those people and focusing on responses that provide really critical support. Um, I think there's an opportunity for an economic recovery plan that is far more beneficial to people who are marginalized. And again, whether that looks like more housing supports or support for low wage essential workers, I think reducing all types of precarity for people should certainly be a priority. Ken, how do you think we should be uh, going forward now? We have, uh, you've, you've talked uh, already about uh, uh, transformations that are taking place in, in the suburbs. Uh, and, and there may be other projects that, that or ideas that you're uh, thinking about uh, that, 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 that pick up on this moment and ensure that in the short term, we're enabling our cities to be safe, uh, and, but also setting us on a path for greater uh, resilience, sustainability, and justice uh, over the longer term. So first of all, I, I would support everything that Belinda just said. I think a lot of seeing what those things are that can really make a difference goes back to observation, to looking carefully at what's going on. So um, it's been pointed out, for example, that when we talk about uh, stimulus funding, instead of reverting to our traditional way of thinking about this, we should understand the gender implications of what's happened with the economic circumstances that we're living in. It's been referred to as a she session. There's a lot of truth to that. What parts of the account of the economy are we are we going to provide the support to for a whole range of reasons? Um, because it's the just thing to do, it's the right thing to do, but it's also the smart thing to do. So I'm really interested to hear Catherine McKenna, our Minister of Infrastructure, talk about social infrastructure being a high priority, not just building uh, bridges and pipes and, uh, and roads. Um, I think if we look at long-term care, the fact that we are seeing 
deep flaws in the way we thought about long-term care, thinking of it as a business, as opposed to a part of our health network um, and, and a public service. And what went wrong? I mean, I, it's fascinating that who would have thought that the armed forces would be the ones who would be those keen observers who went into long-term care and they're telling us with first-hand observation the things that were going wrong. All, all of what I'm saying, I guess, is to get from the abstractions, from the big ideas, to get to that really granular understanding of where we can intervene and how and make a difference. And finally, I, I think one of the lessons we've learned is about the value of social cohesion in moments like this. Um, Malcolm Gladwell gave one of these webinars a while ago, and he was quoting somebody who made this really interesting point that if you were the coach of a soccer team and you wanted to have a winning team, you wouldn't invest, lavish your time on improving the skills of your star player. You would actually concentrate on the worst players on the team. Because soccer is a team sport. You've, you've got 11 players on the field, they all have to be good. Um, and if you have weak links, doesn't matter how good your star is, they're gonna score goals against you. Um, the city of Helsinki, in a similar vein, brags about having the best, worst schools in the world. And so I, I think we're seeing that idea of social cohesion is very, very powerful. Um, I, I have to make a slight comparison between Canada and the U.S., where there, we, by and large, our three levels of government are at least trying to collaborate, where People are coming together, whereas what we're seeing in the U.S. is unbelievable politicization of something like a face mask. Who would have imagined? And, and so not being connected socially, being at odds with each other, make, is an extreme source of vulnerability. So what I want to see is I, wanna, I want us to concentrate on all those weak links that Melinda was talking about to make a stronger society and I want us to understand that by doing that, that's how we succeed. And that's how we will succeed when we deal with this even larger problem, climate change. Melinda, maybe I can turn to you for uh, some final comments about uh, you entering into the workforce. Um, you're a, a new graduate. Um, how do you, what, where do you see um, your, uh, uh, where would you most like to contribute? Do you see yourself working uh, uh, in the public sector? Do you see uh, a private sector role, uh, perhaps with a nonprofit working from the outside? What is your sort of dream job coming out of school to contribute and, 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 and drive the changes that you've uh, so eloquently talked about in this conversation? Um, I mean, to be honest, I think it's hard to answer because entering the workforce right now doesn't seem like a reality. Um, but I mean, it, it is difficult to picture, but I think ideally I would love to work in public sector. I would love to work more in a policy oriented role potentially, um, specifically more in housing policy or service planning. Um, but again, I think that is hard to picture. Um, and I think the thing that I love about planning is there are so many different things that you can do with it and there are so many different things that I would be happy doing. But yeah, I would say housing policy or service planning is sort of where I would ideally see myself. And do you see the public sector, private sector, where do you see uh, your ability to, to, to drive the most change or nonprofit? How do you, how do you uh, conceptualize that? I think that's also hard to see in something in terms of where the most change can happen and something I will certainly learn only as I start my career, but I think personally, I would like to start in the public sector. Ken, and a uh, final question to you then. Uh, this all started out as a commencement address. Do you have any last uh, parting thoughts for our new graduates as they uh, go out into the working world? Well, I'm, I'm gonna pick up on your last question to Melinda. And what I always recommend to young people who ask me that question is, try a number of different things and don't don't just move into one career path and not that you would be able to do it anyway but the more you can have varied experiences and be on different sides of the table and see the world from different places the more it will enhance your value um, in in the larger picture um, 
I, I think, you know, this is a terrible moment to be graduating, the precarity about getting a job, of, you know, paying your student loan. I mean, everything that comes with that. On the other hand, it's an incredibly exciting moment because the, the cards have all, the deck has been thrown up. All the cards are flying off the table. More things are possible now in this moment that might have been in a more stable period. And I know that's, that's not great consolation when you're dealing with uh, you know, a lot of immediate problems and financial worries and all the rest of it. But I think be bold, be inventive, um, try things, uh, reach out to people you might not have reached out to otherwise, uh, look for new combinations of things that you maybe hadn't thought of. And I, what I'm sensing, at least in our part of the world, that's not necessarily the way other parts of the world are experiencing this, is there is, um, I know this might sound almost sentimental, but I think people are really trying to be kind, to be to treat each other with a little more um, respect and care um, than they might otherwise have done. And so let's take advantage of that. I think that's a great place to conclude. Uh, uh, with a sense of optimism that we can, that, that really where we go from here is a joint collective decision and it's, it's not predetermined and it, it will be uh, guided by, uh, by all of us uh, engaging and uh, being generous to each other and generous in how we bring others uh, into the conversation and have their voice be meaningfully heard. Um, with that, I want to thank the panel uh, for, a, for a fascinating discussion. Um, thank you also to the audience uh, for uh, uh, attending today. Uh, I want to remind you that the link uh, to a recording of the event will be emailed out in the next day or so. Um, in terms of future events, the School of Cities has a lot going on. Uh, we have a partnership with the schwartz Reisman Institute for Technology and Society uh, at the Monk School of Globe. Uh, global Affairs. We'll be releasing a new report in the coming weeks on governance innovation. Um, and for more information on what is happening uh, at the School of Cities, visit, visit us at schoolofcities.com and you can sign up for our uh, monthly newsletter. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks to the panel. Have a great day and stay safe.